Okay, uh, good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Lina Magaya, and I'm, uh, I'm with Prairie View a and University. Uh, it's a small school in Houston, Texas. It's about 30, 30 miles uh, northwest of Houston. And um, I'm here with, uh, with six other members. And first of all, we just want to thank uh, the IGM committee, uh, the IGM team, for, le for letting us uh, the opportunity to participate this year. And we're very excited to be, to be here. Thank you. Um, go back. OK. Uh, our title is uh, Plasmic uh, PUC57 Sulfur 3 Metallic Gene Probe uh, to Identify uh, Hydrocarbons. Uh, a little bit about the background uh, f uh, f of our for, for our research that we carried out uh, from to the end of the summer to throughout and throughout the semester is that uh, cut iron porphyrin rings uh, such as zinc, copper, iron, and hence messenger RNA expression in fungi. And this work was carried out by our PI, uh, Dr. Quero, in 2005. Cut iron porphyrins, porphyrin rings are also found in petroleum oil. So they can be used as markers. And the reason why we picked out this point is that uh, Texas is a big uh, oil, uh, state. So that, that was uh, part of our interest as well. Uh, cut iron porphyrin rings uh, mediate redox potential reactions. And they produce reactive uh, hydroxide that oxidizes DNA. And we also know that iron sulfur clusters, such as the uh, three iron, four sulfur cluster uh, in the oxidized form will induce a repression of a gene uh, of genes while the reduced form for the ferroxidin 1 cluster would depress the gene expression uh, and this is uh, done by so this is work done by AJ Thompson and we also know that genes um, are made of hundreds of atoms and that uh, and that Atoms in this, uh, and ions, such as metal ions, say, like the ones we, uh, we're going to talk about, iron, vanadium, and nickel, are, uh, are ions are atoms in themselves. So they, um, they follow a simple principle of energy, uh, a simple principle of energy, of, of principle of energy, I'm sorry. Uh, and we know that ions are mediators for redox and oxidation reactions which is the basis for sensorability. And that is basically what we were focusing on is the sensorability of the uh, probe that we developed. Okay. Okay. Uh, metal ions bind to DNA, to the negative charged sugar phosphate of the DNA. And I'm going to show you right here. Say, for instance, if we have different metals, they'll always react to the uh, oxygen on the, fo on the negatively charged phosphate groups of DNA. Therefore, they cause uh, the unwinding and winding of DNA. Okay. Okay. Uh, our objective was to develop a standardized metallogen, uh, standardized metallogenes for sensing hydrocarbons by using metal ions, uh, iron two, nickel two, and vanadium six as a marker. Okay. Then our hypothesis for developing the gene probe was the sensorability. Uh, was the sensorability of metal ions to detect hydrocarbons using standard DNA components, that is the parts that we obtain from the biobricks. Okay. okay. Uh, first of all, I'd like to talk about um, the plasmid that we, we were able to get synthesized. Uh, our ultimate probe was containing the PUC57 uh, plasmid. This is where we assembled all the um, the, uh, the biobrick parts and also other metal iron promoters that were synthesized for us and we were also able to contribute them to the biobricks. So uh, the basis for our, our isolation for the different plasmids was that we used, uh, in the PUC57, it has uh, cut sites at, uh, of ECO RI, it also has X-Bar1 and also has uh, PST1, HIND3, and BUM H1, and of which uh, three of those with, were some of the uh, enzymes that were used in the standardized parts. Okay. Okay. So our synthesized PUC57 contained a sulfur uh, promoter 
uh, and it had 588 base pairs. And the sulfur promoter is similar to MET32P, which uh, we obtained from uh, one of the microorganisms that uh, we work with. Okay, and this uh, and this uh, plasmid had a unique site, uh, at, uh, a unique cut size at BAMH for BAMH1 and ECORV at the five prime and three prime ends, and that's that is how we we edit them. Okay. Okay. So uh, to start with, we these were the parts that we contributed to the registry. Uh, our parts consisted of uh, uh, three. Metal, metal ion promoters that were uh, like gated to fluorescent proteins, the um, uh, MRFP1 and the GF, uh, sorry, and the EC, ECFP and EYFP. Okay. Okay. So I'm going to talk about our different ligations. So we had different levels for ligations. So first of all, we isolated our um, our plasmids. Uh, we isolated uh, several plasmids from the biobricks. Uh, it took us about, say, about a whole month to isolate different plasmids, and then uh, we transformed those into uh, E. coli, and we transformed it into Micrococcus sluice cells. Um, and then um, we were able to insert the metal ion promoters into the different, into those different um, transformed cells. Uh, so first of all, the level one of our uh, level one ligation involved inserting the uh, metal ion promoters. VN VNFH is a, a vanadium promoter from uh, Azobacter vinlendi, okay, and we we, we digested it with PSC1 and ECOR1, and we inserted it into ECFP, which was a is a for 22 from the bio from the biobricks, and then uh, the second ligation was uh, inserting. A, a nickel um, promoter into the uh, into a, a fluorescent protein, and the third ligation was uh, inserting an iron promoter into a, another fluorescent protein. Another fluorescent protein of which this would differ. These three ligations were also contributed to the biobricks. Okay, <laughs> and then after that we had a fourth ligation where we inserted it into a plas into plasmid SB one A two from the biobricks. To form another um, another uh, part, that, another device that we also contributed to the bio, uh, to the biobricks. Okay. So the f the line one is just the previous slide that I showed you. Uh, it's the same thing, and then this shows the um, the different biobricks that actu that are actually in the registry right now. Uh, J four eight one zero six and eleven and one zero three. Okay, line two. Uh, ligation consisted of uh, uh, us constructing a protein coding region from uh, a lax a lax a lax I sequence and uh, a signaling sequence, and this was uh, also like get it into the PUC fifty seven, okay, and we also um, we also f we also uh, uh, ligated it to f we also ligated like two plasmids. To form a signaling sequence that was also inserted into the PUC57, um, and then ultimately our PUC57 contained all three metal ion promoters, including the sulfur promoter, uh, within a cloning site of uh, of the small one region. Okay. Okay. So ultimately, the final uh, probe. Uh, had um, a cap binding site at the beginning, a like C, uh, like C region, and like R, like R one, like R, and then uh, okay. So our ultimate, our ultimate probe was the one that was used to transform uh, E. coli and Micrococcus. So uh, in the end, we just favored the. Uh, in the end, our probe favored uh, transformation to Micrococcus, so we're just able to continue work with uh, Micrococcus instead of E. coli. Okay. 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 The second, the second uh, probe that we designed has actually not been tested. We have not done any work with it, but we're, we're planning on it because right now we're just still in the phase one of our experiments, where we're still putting together our our our, our assembly. And uh, doing different experimental designs. 
Okay. So um, we uh, tr we transfer we we've, we did several control experiments in um, with my with Micrococcus. Uh, we subjected it to uh, uh, different conditions. For instance, oxygen, the presence of uh, the presence and abs absence of oxygen. We also subjected it to different metal iron concentrations from zero to fifty parts per million of of iron, nickel, and vanadium. And we were able to transform the micrococcus cells, and this uh, plate sure the control cells at a uh, time, it goes to 40 hours. I couldn't get you the time, it goes to eight, uh, zero and 18 hours. But this also shows the, uh, the <coughs> sorry, the, the plate on the, right, on, the, on the left side shows the transformed cells of the micrococcus cells uh, at time it goes to eight, 18 hours. Okay, Th these two plates indicate uh, the level one ligations where we just inserted the metal ion sequences with, um, with the, the metal ion promoter sequences in the fluorescent proteins. And we were, we were able to get, uh, what we noticed was that instead of, ex instead of our cells expressing, say, uh, the red fluorescent protein or the cayenne fluorescent protein, what happened is we got a myriad of colors in our plates that were expressed, uh, and this, these were actually viewed under a transluminometer, trans um, and we saw this myriad of, of colors, and, and this was persistent throughout the, the time that we actually kept them in incubation. Okay, okay. Um, what we, one of the things that we were interested in was, a measure, uh, was measuring the expression of uh, the lax genes which we determined by measuring luminescence using the uh, Turner 2020 and uh, uh, luminometer. And we, well, we also subjected our, uh, our bacteria to uh, growing conditions, like I said before, to growing conditions of, uh, say, zero, zero parts per million of the metal ions, two parts per million, and 50 parts per million. And we also introduced the hydrocarbon thiophenol uh, to, to those growing conditions. And we did several control experiments and we found that the cells that were grown in the, abs in, in the presence of the hydrocarbon and in the absence of oxygen showed higher lumi uh, luminescence at about 80, which is greater than the control cells that are found from uh, phase one through five. Okay, and this was measured in uh, relative luminescent units. Okay, um, the next table shows the biosensorability of trimetallic gene probe in relation to DNA expression under different metal ion concentrations as compared to uh, non-transformed cells. Um, <coughs> our, uh, our transformed cells our transformed cells were subjected uh, to the same conditions as the non-transformed cells, like I said, at different metal ion concentration and also in the presence and absence of the hydrocarbon and oxygen. And we found that uh, our DNA concentrations were, uh, were higher in the cells that were transformed with the probe and in the presence of oxygen and in the presence of the, uh, hy of the hydrocarbon and at two parts per million with 18.3 with a nanograms per milliliter as compared to the control cells that had lower, um, lower DNA concentrations. Okay, okay this was a, a, a gel from the native DNA of the micrococcus uh, before transformations. Uh, we don't have the slide for um, the, the transformed cells after we had the probe, but would have loved to show it to you. Um, one of the interesting things that we, we found was we were determining the colony forming units of the transformed cells and the non-transformed cells. Um, our transformed cells at, at day one at time is equal to 1800, at 18 hours, I'm sorry, had higher colony, uh, more colony forming units as compared to uh, transformed cells with single metal ion promoters and also with the final probe that contained the three metal three metal promoters. Uh, 
And then at day two, something interesting happened. Uh, we found that our, pro, our, uh, our, cell, our cells containing the probe had higher colony forming units than, um, than, the, um, than the control cells and those cells that had been uh, transformed with the, the single metal promoters. Okay. okay. Uh, the next table shows a series of experiments that we carried out. Uh, we carried out at time zero, eighteen, and forty hours. We measured the di we measured pH, millivoltage, and DNA concentrations, and we found that Micrococcus has the ability to grow in both carbon dioxide and oxygen atmospheres. But, however, in the presence of uh, diaphenyl, uh, uh, it enables the transformed Micrococcal cells to grow under carbon dioxide uh, atmospheres. Okay, and uh, the rest of the tables are similar to the one that I just showed you, but we found that the hydrocarbon diaphenyl provides the substrate for catalase and oxidase, which allows for better growth in low oxygen concentrations. Okay, go on. Okay, uh, when we were measuring the pH, uh, the pH and the millivoltages, we found that the redox potential is higher under carbon dioxide and atmospheric condition and atmosphere conditions, and we know that carbon dioxide is a Reductance, so this pretty much helped uh, in the sensorability of the metal ions. Okay, and uh, based on the tables that I, ju I just showed you, uh, we, show we saw that the redox potential threshold was around 300 millivoltage, which indicates that sensorability for the metal ions actually took place. Okay, uh, one of the explanations for what was taking place is that, uh, uh, like I mentioned before, uh, I'll our plasmid contained a sulfur protein in it, and this sulfur protein was the one that mediated the, rea the reactions uh, between uh, the three different metal ions that were subjected to, to the, pro to the uh, cells transformed by the, uh, with the probe. Uh, we find that sulfur is a bridging ligand to the in the copper side for cytochrome oxidase, and it is important is a comp important component of coenzyme A. And that sulfur is used in uh, is, is hydrogen sulfide and can be used in, a pl in place of water as an electron donor. And that uh, iron, cl iron sulfur cluster mot motifs found in metalloproteins such as feroxidins, uh, NADH dehydrogenase coenzyme Q, cytochrome C, reductors of the electron transport systems. And I, like I mentioned before, the iron clusters that, that exist, the iron sulfur cl uh, clusters that exist provide uh, bridging ligands by uh, different configurations, such as the two iron four, two iron two, and two iron, uh, two nitrogen atoms of histidine. And um, we also find that uh, we have an interesting configuration where there's a three iron full sulfur, three iron full sulfur cluster. And these are the ones that uh, contribute to the winding and unwinding of the DNA. And um, wh when all this is happening, there's interaction of the different metal ions mediated by the sulfur, by, by sulfur. Okay. Okay, and uh, because we didn't really have somebody to model for us to do some uh, very creative modeling, so I just did a bootleg model for what was actually taking place. And one of the things that we're looking forward to find out is whether all the metal, all the metal ion promoter sequences, were they, uh, were they activated? And whether all the um, metal ions, metal ions, the in vanadium, nickel, and sulfur, sorry, vanadium, nickel, and iron were actually taking place in any of the reactions within the cells. So one of the things is that uh, sulfur forms uh, sulfur forms sulfurs with the three uh, metals, and uh, they. They, they do the same job by, uh, they attack the negatively charged phosphate, uh, phosphate uh, uh, oxygen phosphate and phosphate groups. Okay. And uh, so ultimately we wanted to, wanted to show that, okay, we've, we developed a system or a machine where we had the input, we put the metal ions and into the cells and we had different, uh, uh, different uh, output signals by using different fluorescent proteins. And we also had one ultimate fluorescent protein which was contained in the plasmid, one, uh, plasmid SB1A2, which is a yellow fluorescent protein. 
Okay. And then in conclusion, our barbaric assemblance resulting in PU57 was achieved. Um, we, we think that there's a possibility of different assemblages that can be configured to sense different, to, to carry out different sensor abilities. Okay. And uh, secondly, the PUC57 S3M probe showed fire sensorability to different metal ion concentration related to hydrocarbons. And, um, okay. and uh, hopefully uh, a much cheaper biological initiator in synthetic oil production will, um, will be the next thing to develop. And then uh, we also look forward to having possibly a better alternative to micro diesel production and we hope this probe will be used as a device that can be used in industry as a non-persistent biological chelator and complexation agent with a triple function. And, um, okay. We'd like to thank uh, Prairie View a and uh, the Cooperative Agriculture Research Center for letting us use the lab. And uh, I'd like to thank Dr. Quero for his support and his uh, technical advice. And I'd also like to thank my team uh, that I came with. Thank you. To achieve, uh, to accomplish remediation, you're saying? Actually, what we're doing is actually another form of remediation because uh, this is a form of bioremediation because bioremediation, as we know it, is using um, um, microbes, you know, to remove, say, metal ion contamination from the environment. In this case, although I did not mention it, this is, an, this is another form of bioremediation. We just did not measure, say, uh, the concentrations after the cell had already been subjected to the um, to the to the different metal ion concentrations, but uh, based on our results, we know that bioremediation is also taking place because uh, the cells would not have reacted to the you know like they wouldn't have shown the luminescence that they did if they had not taken up the um, the metal ions. So that's another form of bioremediation. Um, yes, we did. Like I said, one of the places that, uh, the, actually the two plays that I showed before, those showed the ones with the, the single metal ion promoters with, um, but we didn't, we didn't actually test, like say, just the fluorescent protein by itself in the... I, I meant promoter, single fluorescent protein, but not the entire system. Um, say that one more time. Just the single metal protein attached to a single... Uh, fluorescent protein. Fluorescent. Yeah, the, those were the plates. So, uh, and this, they, they showed there was some kind of a repression as far as the expression for, the f for that fluorescent protein because what happened is it's, it still showed those different colors. So something we haven't, that we haven't looked at, it was actually taking place because of the metal ion sequence uh, that we inserted in the, in the fluorescent protein. Uh, you mean as far as the concentrations? In terms of your sensor. In terms of the sensor itself? Yeah. Did we test the single? Just to see whether, well, what would happen? No, we didn't. We still, that's one of the things we're also going to do. Because we, we were short of time, so we just wanted to go straight to the, to the probe. Thank <laughs> you.